Home Radio. Creator and presenter, Kate Jones. Music video produced by Jonathan, the producer. Hello, this is At Home Radio, a welcoming space for insight and exuberance. I'm Kate Jones, and today's conversation is about managing stress, and Anxiety with Kimberly Ganley, an energy medicine and Reiki practitioner. Welcome, Kimberly. Hello. So nice to see you. So nice to have you here on the, on the program. You're the owner of the Energy Wellness Studio in Richfield, Ohio. And, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are looking for ways to reduce stress and anxiety these days. So what is energy medicine anyway, and how can it help us improve our health? So energy medicine has really been around forever. And energy medicine is really this umbrella and it combines different concepts worldwide of time honored traditions and and it puts them together with today's scientific health and healing knowledge. So some of the things that you may be familiar with, such as yoga, meditation, acupuncture, Reiki, and Tai Chi are all examples of energy medicine. And energy is really all around us. You know, we are each uniquely made up of our own energy patterns, and we have energy systems within us. So because energy likes to flow and move, energy medicine really promotes that flow. And if it's not flowing and if it gets stuck, it can cause pain, illness, disease, and and, and different ailments like that. So it's really important that that we practice energy medicine to really maintain a healthy energetic flow that promotes our, our overall vitality and good health. So I educate my clients not only on these ancient healing techniques, but also on energy medicine practices, exercises, and I specifically work with acupressure points by tapping them, pressing them, connecting them, and strengthening them. Okay, and there are different types of energy medicine, aren't there? That's right, that's correct. So which ones, what are the different types that you use in your practice? I actually use three different modalities. So the first modality I use is I'm a certified practitioner with Donna Eden's Energy Medicine Methods. So this is really the study of muscle movement called kinesiology. So we use energy testing matched with energy exercises. And then the second modality I use is the energy psychology. It's known as emotional freedom techniques, which is EFT tapping. And this really is just about a gentle pressure and a gentle tapping of acupressure points. And the third and final modality I use is the Japanese art, um, the Japanese healing art of Reiki. And as a certified master and teacher, I honor the Zui Tibetan lineage, lineage and the Karuna Holy Fire. I don't know what those mean. <laughs> Could you <laughs> just sum them up just a teeny bit? <laughs> sure, sure. And, and specifically with Reiki, since it has come from Japan, there are just different traditions or different lineages that you can be trained in. Okay. All right, that sounds good. Sort of like feng shui for the Chinese, you know, are, um, um, it, there are whole different schools of thought about it, but it has yes. a basic um, um, basic um, connection between all of them, and that's qi, the flow of energy. So That's right, that's yeah, right. So they're just cool. kind of like different schools, different mm-hmm, modalities right. for Reiki. So energy medicine, how did you get into it? Well, you know, both my dad and my grandma had Parkinson's. So back in 2005, my cousin Kristen and I 
we founded a local grassroots nonprofit organization by the name of Courageous Steps for Parkinson's. And our mission was really just to create awareness of the disease, create some funding and resources. And we did this by holding an annual walk and run. So in the five years that we did that, we raised $250,000. And you know, it was, it was really magnificent. You know, I watched my dad and I watched my grandma really have these challenges, mental, mm -hmm. physically, emotionally. I mean, this disease was debilitating. Things mm -hmm. that you and I take for granted, like walking and talking, was an mm -hmm. everyday challenge for them. I mean, they had medicine stacked on their counters. I mean, and some were actually to offset the others. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as, as this disease progressed, it became debilitating. And our family, we kind of felt helpless. So the money that I raised in Northeast Ohio, I knew that I wanted to keep it in Northeast Ohio. And I wanted to impact those in our community that were affected by the disease. But I also knew that it had to be done in a non-traditional way. So in 2008, I sat down with the medical director of the Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center over at the University Hospitals of Neurological Institute, and we started to collaborate. We really wanted to develop a program that integrated Eastern medicine and Western medicine and, and really provide patients with pre preventative medicine. So we did just that. We developed um, a program called the PD Boot Camp, the Parkinson's Disease Poop Boot Camp. And our aim was just simply to provide support, advice, and education. So basically, this was a huge success. We, we, and in two years of collaboration, we actually trademarked the program because our first program had over 200 attendees. So as, um, as we started to develop this, you know, this became a huge success. I mean, it was popular. People were empowered and they were feeling fantastic. That's so great. How many years, people attended these, these boot camps? Well, you know, in just five years of launching this, it became a multi-state crowd of both patients and caregivers. And it was, you know, close to about a thousand people. And everybody, you know, was wanting to learn non-traditional ways and traditional ways of really what can they do? You know, practices, nutrition, mm -hmm. mind and body wellness programs. So it was really, really exhilarating to watch this grow. I mean, it was, a, it was such, a, such a hit. I mean, this program gave people the voice. It empowered them on their wellness journeys and their mm -hmm. healing journeys. And you know, my dad, Mickey, he truly was my inspiration for, for really wanting to understand what Eastern medicine was saying about disease. So in 2009, I started my first Reiki class for caregivers, and this was my, the first glimpse. I mean, it truly linked for me what, what energy was, was doing and how it was impacting our health. So, mm -hmm. you know, courageous steps, we, we no longer have the walks, and my dad and my grandmother have passed. But those Parkinson's boot camps, they are still going strong. They're on their 11th year and they've gone to a virtual series. So it's really from his passing that I find myself so motivated to share in the knowledge that transformed my life, even though I didn't really practice energy medicine with him. Yeah, wow. That is, well, you weren't, you weren't at that point yet. Correct. You're still learning. Correct. And I and, was practicing um, Reiki as a caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, so I did get I did get to do that with him. But boy, would I love to have shared the knowledge I know today with him. So then you started getting your credentials too, in you actually studying them to do this work with other people. Is that correct? That's correct. You know, the more I was learning about Reiki. And the more I was seeing how energy impacted our health, it was like the more and more I wanted to learn. And I really delved deep and was like, what is Eastern medicine saying about disease? And how can I help others feel empowered? Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. So um, 
basically then um, this is something that is so not new. You mentioned it's ancient. So uh, would you talk about that a little bit um, sure, more about sure. how long it's been around? Absolutely. You know, Chinese medicine has been, you know, been around for like 5,000 years. And actually, I, I would bet that even when our earliest ancestors from millions of years ago, I bet they were even practicing energy medicine. You know, for example, when you get bad news, what do you do? You instantly bring your hand to your heart and shock. Or you bring your hand to your head like, oh, no, oh my gosh. Do you know what you're actually doing? Your what? hand is electromagnetic. So when you bring your hand to your heart or you bring your hand to your head, you are actually restoring the blood flow to those organs. Oh, that's so wonderful. I bet you, I bet you, I bet you our earliest ancestors were doing energy medicine and not even knowing it. Oh, that's great. Well, what I like about it is that it literally helps us take matters into our own hands. And it's easy and non-invasive, which that's is right. also terrific, terrific. You've said that it helps people form healthy habits. How does it do that? You know, and that's true. It does form healthy habits. You know, because it is so simple and so effective and it's non-invasive, anybody can practice energy medicine. And when you practice energy medicine, specifically by doing like daily energy routines and daily energy exercises, it actually promotes your energy to flow in a pattern and to not get stuck. So it does help you to form healthy energetic habits. And we talked about uh, stress and anxiety anxiety, which I think we'll go into a little bit more with, with um, your, at, at least one of your demonstrations. Um, but it's also supposed to be good for dealing with a whole lot of other, a host of other issues. And I like this a lot. It can help with anti-aging. How so? That's correct, Kate. It does. So I want to kind of break this down. You know, you've got to kind of understand some of these components. So when we look at energy, energy is really emotions that are moving. You know, you've got them all, you know, when you have an emotion, it's carried throughout your whole entire body. So for example, you have a thought and then that thought drives your emotions. And then those emotions drive your thoughts and pretty soon you are on this loop, okay? Mm -hmm. So. I first want to just start by saying it's completely normal. Stress is normal. All feelings are normal. I mean, we are wired for stress and survival. You know, as I was talking about our earliest ancestors, mm -hmm. you know, it, they had one goal in mind, and that was to stay alive, right? I mean, we needed our watchdog brain in order mm -hmm. to not be eaten by the bears, by the lions. So... The problem really is when we are in this state of stress, this hypervigilance for so long, it wreaks havoc on our bodies, especially our, our energy systems. So right. I like to use this example of a candle burning, okay, to illustrate kind of how the brain and the body are affected by stress. So basically, let's say we have a candle burning, right? Our, mm -hmm. our body takes it in through our senses we, we interpret it in our limbic brain. And immediately when we, when we smell that candle, our amygdala fires. Danger, danger, the house is on fire, right? Oh. So our survival mode immediately kicks in and the sympathetic nervous system turns on and your body thinks it's a danger. Your heart starts beating fast, right? That candle's burning. Your blood pressure increases. And all of your blood flows away from your brain and into your limbs because you're going to get ready to either flee that burning house, to fight that fire, or you might even freeze in that fire, okay? So it's really not until we are processing that the smell is only a candle, it's not the house burning down, and that we're going to be okay and survive, that, that, that it's okay. So we do this and we assign it language, and this happens in our neofrontal cortex. You know, we say, oh, it's just the candle burning. It's not the house burning down. 
And when we assign it language, the amygdala calms. So what happens when we do this? The parasympathetic system can, can restore.